What is electrochemical machining? So electrochemical machining is a process where you use electrolysis, controlled electrolysis, to dissolve metal in a controlled pattern in a way such that you can shape metal without having to rely on traditional machining. So traditional machining like grinding or milling or turning something on a lathe requires rigidity because you're using you know, a harder metal part to cut a softer metal part and you have to jam those metal parts together really hard in order to actually make them cut one another. So electrochemical machining is novel in that the metal part that's cutting the other metal part, the two parts never actually touch. They use the transfer of electrons, electricity, conduction, to actually take care of the cutting, the machining of the material. So when applied to uh, certain processes, like uh, making barrels, you can use electrochemical machining in novel ways without needing the big, heavy rigidity that traditional machining tools require you to have. So picture, if you would, that this is just a standard hydraulic tube like like those that you can order from China. They're heat treated, they're pressure tested, but it's just a straight hydraulic tube. The inside is just one constant inside diameter, and that inside diameter doesn't even match the bore diameter of the sort of barrels that you would it doesn't it's not the same inside diameter as, you know, barrels should be. But it's a, you know, a good quality steel hydraulic tube. Using electrochemical machining, you could take this plain tube and make it rifled, chambered, and bored to size such that it would work perfectly as a barrel. Electrochemical machining allows you to do this at an incredibly low cost with an incredibly low level of complexity. It may sound very difficult, very uh, confusing whenever I throw around, throw around words like electrolysis and electrons and machining even is a, a term foreign to some people. But I can't stress enough that this is actually a very simple process and hopefully this video will help you better understand from a high level that electrochemical machining isn't actually very complex. It's fairly novel once you understand the big terms and concepts behind it. So without any more delay, let's briefly talk about how this electrochemical machining setup works. So with any electrochemical machining, you have your workpiece, and in our case, that's the barrel or the hydraulic tube as it starts off life. And you have a cutting tool. The cutting tool can take the shape of essentially any anything any shape that you can make, you can make into a cutting tool. So if we had this barrel and it was just a constant inside diameter and we wanted to make that inside diameter bigger, we could take something like a steel rod and if we could hold that dead in the middle of this barrel and run the electrochemical machining process, the barrel inside diameter would grow larger and larger and larger the longer we cut. Thus, we can take a barrel that's a smaller inside diameter than a barrel diameter would need to be and bring it out slowly until it is the proper inside diameter. This is known as boring. So you, you take a barrel that's you know undersized bore and make it bigger. So it's a boring process. Uh, you can actually use these 3D printed tools over here. We'll go through them bit by bit and sort of list off their names and what they're for as we go. But you can use these 3D printed tools to help with the, you know, the complex part here actually ends up being how do you get this steel rod to sit center in this bore? Because obviously you couldn't just sit here and hold it by hand. That would never work. So you use these 3D printed tools to assist. These two tools are the fixture and the fitting. You don't have to print this tool. In fact, I kind of recommend you get the brass version of this tool. The formal ECM documentation, which is in the description below this video, will walk you through like step-by-step -step detailed exactly how you do each step of this. And th that, will, that video also has the links to all of the sort of things that I'm going to show you as well as the files and the inform inf information and documentation. This video is specifically just going to pertain to the high level overview. So these two tools fit together And the spigot here on the fitting makes it so you can hook up a rubber hose. And that rubber hose lets water flow through from a pump. That water is going to be salt water in our case. And that salt water conducts electricity really well. And that makes it a good electrolyte for electrochemical machining. Because as I'm sure you can imagine, even when this rod is held there in the middle of this barrel, it's not going to conduct electricity unless there's something that bridges the gap between them. In our cases, it's going to be salt water. So, you can see that these tools will begin to hold everything in the right place, but there's just a little bit of wiggle from this rod. And so that's where our end pilot comes in. 
Our end pilot slips over the end of the barrel and has a concentric hole that will help hold the rod perfectly centered down the bore of this barrel so that we can hook everything up electrically and then run our electrochemical machining process. So you'll have fluid pumping through the barrel and it just spews out here at the bottom down into a reservoir. And as the fluid passes through here, it'll actually be conveying the electricity that's used to cut this barrel. So electrochemical machining, I mentioned, was an electrolysis process. And like the very quick version of what that means is, if you remember back to high school chemistry, there's ionic bonds where uh, electrons are shared between atoms. And that, that, generally speaking, that's how steel alloys get their strength is metal ions and alloy, you know, the, the alloying elements in this metal barrel hold together to make the barrel strong. However, if you pump an electrolyte past there in a, a surplus of electrons, you can convince those metal ions to abandon the barrel. So they'll form more favorable ions with the salt in the water or with the water itself, you know, the atoms and the salt and the atoms in the water itself, and they'll just let go of the barrel. They'll find some place that they're happier and they'll actually dissolve off of the barrel. So as the water pumps through, the barrel itself actually ends up dissolving, and then the dissolved parts of the barrel are spewed out here at the bottom as the water pumps through. So there are actually two electrical connections that end up needing to be made. And in order to supply the electricity, you just use like a crappy desktop power supply. Uh, if you had like high school, high school or college uh, uh, physics labs or chemistry labs, I'm sure you became familiar with something like this. Depending on how old school you are, they might have been a lot bigger than this and been a lot uglier than this. But it's just a simple power supply that can supply a constant current and you can adjust the voltage on. So you end up hooking up the barrel, the workpiece, to that power supply, as well as your cutting tool to that power supply. And the documentation, of course, goes over how exactly you do that in more detail. But Essentially, all you have to do is make sure that there's a, a circuit, a simple circuit completed between the power supply and the barrel and the power supply and your cutting tool. So long as that's achieved and you have fluid, you know, fresh fluid pumping through to flush out all the uh, metal that gets dissolved, you will be cutting your barrel to a bigger diameter just with this setup. It's fairly simple, easy to take apart and put back together. And when it comes to holding everything together, these fingers that are present that, you know, stick up off of all of these tools, they're actually meant to have a hose clamp slipped over them and then you tighten your hose clamp down and that'll pinch everything together nice and tight so it doesn't move around when you're cutting. So it's a fairly simple setup and assuming that you could you know, follow along and you understood my rambling there, you're fully capable of taking a hydraulic tube and turning a hydraulic tube into something that's bored perfectly to be used as a barrel. It's actually pretty nifty and the documentation walks you through the specifics but that just comes down to reading and following instructions. So that's, that's it for the boring setup, actually. Next up, we're going to go over the rifling setup. You know, these are the steps in order as you actually make these barrels. So you get your barrel, you bore it. Next up, you have to rifle it. This is when my personal favorite tool of this whole setup comes in, and that's the rifling mandrel. We call it a rifling mandrel because it's shaped like a mandrel, which is a different tool used in different applications. We don't have to go into that. But called, you know, the rifling part of its name comes from the fact that this is the tool that will actually facilitate the uh, etching of the rifling into the barrel. After the boring operation, it'll just look like a steel tube down the middle still, where it just has a constant inside diameter. That inside diameter will be proper size to be the bore of a barrel, but it has no features in the barrel. It's just like a slick tube all the way through the middle. This is the part where that changes. The rifling mandrel down here at the base you can see, well, I guess we should start at this end. You can see that there's spiral grooves all the way along the rifling mandrel, but those spiral grooves stop down here. That's because down here is insulated because this is going to be where our chamber is. If you're familiar with the way that rifle barrel, rifle barrels are set up, they have a chamber and rifling. There's no rifling in the chamber, and of course there's no chamber in the rifling because that wouldn't even make sense. But down here where the chamber is, is going to be insulated because we're not going to be cutting rifling into the chamber, just the part of the barrel that we want, you know, the, the rifled part of the barrel. So in order to actually make this tool work, you have to take some copper wire and you actually have to stuff that copper wire inside of the slots here. This sometimes can be a little tricky 
because depending on your print settings and the copper wire you have, things may be a little tight. So sometimes you have to tweak your settings and print another mandrel. But these wire-based mandrels are quite strong. And once you've got a good one printed and assembled, you can use them over and over. In fact, I've got one mandrel here that I've probably used a good 10 times at this point. And so long as you clean them after you're done with them, wash all that nasty salt water and gunk metal off of them, they'll continue to work well for a long time. And I'm just showing here how it is that you take your wire and stuff it down inside of your mandrel. We won't do this for all six grooves, but just to give you an idea, this is generally considered one of the hardest parts of this whole setup, just getting your rifling mandrel to go together just right. It can be a little tedious, a little bit of back and forth required, because you have to make sure that your wire goes in perfectly straight because if it gets a little bent, it won't want to stuff through. Which is why I sort of want to showcase, it doesn't take a very long time to get it. Just have to make sure that your wire follows the track the whole way through. And then here at the bottom, we have our wire poking out. All right, and hopefully that now can let you see you've got a wire twisted in the perfect shape that you need it to and held in place in the mandrel. You'd end up putting five more of these wires in, so you'd have all six for your six uh, grooves that you're going to cut into your barrel. And that ends up being your rifling tool. And of course, the instructions document what you're supposed to do with the, you know, the excess wire, but you end up making this. So this is a completed rifling mandrel. You can see it's got six wires laid into it. And there's, uh, the, you know, the, the putting these tools together will be slightly more complex than the boring setup because, as you can imagine, you know, the, the whenever you're boring, the inside of the tube is uniform and it doesn't really have an up or down or left and a right. It's all the same. When it comes to the rifling tool, once you start making rifling marks in there, there is an up and down and a left and a right. With regards to, you know, if you cut your rifling like this for an amount of time, then take your tool out and measure the rifling you've cut, and then you put it back in, rotated like 20 degrees, your rifling marks that you had previously cut aren't going to line up with the rifling marks you're about to cut. So that's why you have to pay attention to what's known as index whenever you're using this tool. Index is very easy to keep track of, assuming you know what to look out for. So. We still mate our barrel up to our fitting fixture combo the same way. And the first time we install our rifling tool, this one's fitting a little tight down here, but that's good because we don't, we don't want a loose fit. We risk our tool falling off. There we go. Got everything assembled down here. So the first time you push this tool on, you want the rifling mandrel to be fully inserted into the barrel as far as it can go, and that ensures that you're insulating the proper amount of the chamber. But then you want to find the part of this rifling mandrel that has a square-shaped cutout in it. And then all you have to do is take some sort of tool and then scratch along the sides of these fingers with that tool in the same area that has that square-shaped cutout. So that square cutout is between two fingers. Mark the edges of those two fingers, and now you can see we have two marks. And those two marks indicate where the gap between the two fingers with the square cutout always has to go. So, you know, you could, you could cut and cut and cut, and then take your rifling mandrel out, measure your, your rifling, make sure everything is, looks good. If you still need to cut a little bit deeper on your rifling, you just take your rifling mandrel. Everything's tight here again. Take your rifling mandrel, you find your marks that you made, and you line up your marks in that uh, gap with the square cutout, 
put everything back together, go ahead and cut for you know the next period of time, then take everything apart and measure. You just have to pay close attention to where this gap is and where it's marked. So rifling setup probably seems more complex than the boring setup, but once you've got a good hang of things, and really once you've got these tools printed for yourself, you can sort of like, you know, start putting them together and go, oh, okay, you know, it makes sense what he means when he says indexing rifling. So once you've got that figured out, there's nothing really, really stopping you. And hopefully my explanation there made enough sense with regards to, you know, if you cut like this, then take the tools apart, then put them back together, but you rotate the mandrel slightly, if that makes sense to you, why that would cause something wrong to happen, then you already understand what needs to happen whenever you're doing your rifling setup, and that's probably the hardest part. So after you've completed this step, you'll then have rifling cut into your barrel. Of course, this is a finished barrel, so you can see, hopefully, just the little shadows of rifling that's there in that barrel. I've got a, a better barrel here. We can probably see it a little easier. Those rifling marks that you end up cutting in this step. And of course the documentation probably makes an even better explanation as far as how it is that you index, how you check index, and how often you have to take things apart. But just bear that in mind. If my explanation doesn't make sense to you, go ahead and read the documentation because these, you know, the video and documentation should help supplement one another so that both of them sort of make sense to you. Okay, so with that rifling setup done, you're on to the final step of making a barrel, which is cutting the chamber. So the chamber of a barrel is the part where the round goes into. I've got some fired 9mm cases here, but you know, if we can imagine that there was still a bullet here, that this was live ammunition, the chamber is the part where that ammunition goes into on the barrel. Let's see, we've got that one here. We've got another barrel here, just so you can see that. Chamber just accepts the, the cartridge goes into the chamber part of the barrel. So cutting the chamber is probably it's probably the most complex from a uh, you know, from a standpoint of understanding the concepts it's probably the most complex because you know I'm assuming you all understand what rifling's for and what good it does. Uh, when it comes to cutting chambers it's a little bit more complex from a conceptual standpoint because there's a lot going on there's a lot more going on in a chamber than meets the eye. So a uh, nine by nineteen millimeter as as a as a cartridge, like as a as a bullet, you know, co common nomenclature says bullet, but as a cartridge. So the the whole thing, specifically the casing, actually has a taper to it. Even though it looks like the wall of this case is straight, if we hold something straight up against it, you should be able to see it's got a little bit of a taper. So the bottom of the case is actually wider than the top of the case. So the walls of this case are actually more like this than they are parallel. Normally, when cutting a chamber, that doesn't—you don't really have to pay attention to that fact. Uh, if you're if you're like do it do it yourself, or you know, if you're doing this yourself, so, so lots of craft-made firearms just have like a 10 millimeter square-cut chamber for a 9 millimeter cartridge, and that's safe, but it's not going to produce a very accurate barrel, as well as it's not going to produce a barrel that's going to enable the cartridge to extract reliably, because the way that the brass in casings actually works is when, when the round goes off, the brass in this case will actually stretch and expand to match the geometry of the chamber. So if you have a 10 millimeter square cut chamber, this case, which used to be tapered, will blow itself out square, so it will now take the shape of the chamber. And anytime it's square, as you're trying to extract that case, you know, as the case is fired in a semi-automatic firearm, and this case is trying to extract, the case walls will be dragging against the barrel the whole time. If the barrel has square walls, the case blows out to meet those square walls. You know, the parallel on parallel walls will always drag against each other the whole time this case is trying to come out of the barrel. So the solution to that is you have a, a ch chamber that is, you know, it, it has a taper to it as well, a draft angle, just like the case does. And the draft angle doesn't necessarily have to match because, you know, the, the case, you know, say the, let's say the case has a taper like this, even though that's exaggerating, and the chamber, chamber walls have a taper like this, where this is parallel, so it's just got a little bit of taper. The case will blow itself out to the same angle as the chamber, but as soon as it's moved back just a little bit, it's no longer in contact with the walls of the chamber at all, because the chamber is also tapered. So that makes it so there's a lot less drag, a lot less friction for the case to be extracted after being fired. So that's the importance of a tapered chamber. It just makes extraction of the case a little bit easier in the case of a malfunction or in the case of you know, extraction under pressure, which blowback firearms, semi-automatic firearms all still have some level of extraction under pressure 
for the case itself. So that's a lot of concepts, a lot of big terms and words that I'm throwing at you. If none of that made sense, you don't actually have to, you know, so if none of that made sense to you, that doesn't mean that you're not capable of making a barrel. That's all very high level concept stuff that I like to explain just because a lot of people, even people who don't really understand chambers very well, like to ask, like, why does, why should a chamber be tapered? Just a common sort of question. So there's that. If that didn't make sense to you, don't, don't abandon hope. Don't get frustrated. Go and read through the documentation and it'll, it'll sort of explain without confusing you with concepts. It will go through and teach you at a very low level, you know, like very, very detailed. It'll go through and tell you what you need to do and it won't try and preach to you what you should understand. So when it comes to cutting our chamber, it's ideal if we can make it just tapered a little bit, if possible. I've done a lot of barrels with uh, no taper. I've done a lot of barrels with taper. The barrels with taper are consistently more accurate, more reliable, and they're not really that much harder to make. So the way that you actually ensure that your barrel takes a taper is, as you may be able to imagine, your cutting tool just needs to have a taper on it. Because when you're using electric chemical machining, your cutting, your, your cutting piece, your work piece, takes the shape of the cutting tool that you're electrochemically machining with. If we just want the barrel inside diameter to get bigger, we just use a central, same diameter all the way around steel rod. If we want grooves cut into it, we use a cutting tool that's got grooves. If we want a little bit of taper cut in the chamber, we take a steel rod that has a little bit of taper on it. So hopefully you can see there where this, this piece of rod started life as just normal steel rod like this. And then using a battery drill and a metal file, I just added a little bit of taper. So it tapers down to that shoulder there. So you don't actually have to be extremely precise when you do this. And you may think I'm exaggerating, but literally the way I did this is with one hand, I held down the trigger on this drill. And with the other hand, I just took a metal file and I just scraped the metal file while the drill was spinning like that. And it probably took me a good 10, 15 minutes. But while holding the file against the barrel, you focus most of your time cutting here and then less and less time as you go further back. And you'll actually establish a, ch uh, a chamfer or a taper on the rod just by doing that. The documentation has more details on the specifics of how you go about doing that. But whenever you're all said and done, you'll have a tapered rod. Taper doesn't have to be extremely precise, it just has to be present, because if the rod has taper, the chamber will have taper, and even just a little bit of taper will go a long way in terms of making sure that your barrel can extract a little bit more reliably. Okay, so with that explained, I'll now briefly touch on how it is that you take this tool, because you know some of you may be some of you may be anticipating the question. If you have this just shoved up inside of the barrel to cut your chamber, won't you be destroying your rifling? You know, because you know, past this point. And you're correct, if you just shoved this tool in the barrel and tried to use it to cut your chamber, you'd completely destroy your barrel. And that's when this guy comes in. This is known as the chambering insulator. All that this tool does is insulates the parts of the chambering rod that you don't want to be cutting the barrel at that given point in time. So this tool actually, you know, once you've added a taper to your metal part, you'll stick this tool inside of the chambering insulator. And in order to get the proper distance into the chambering insulator set, you actually use this tool. And all that this tool is for is you take your chambering rod, take your chambering insulator, you set it up right like that, and then you just push it down till this tool is flat, and you use JB Weld inside of this insulator, and then let it sit up like that until the JB Weld is solidified, and then you can push these tools apart. And once you push these tools apart, your chambering chambering rod with its taper will be perfectly aligned with your chamber insulator, like this one, and you'll be ready to cut with it. You should be able to see this one's only got a very slight chamber taper. It doesn't have very much at all. The barrel that I made with this particular cutting tool uh, is it turned out perfect, and I don't think I've had a single extraction issue with it, even running high pressure ammunition, low pressure ammunition, heavy bullets, light bullets. It's just run great. Meanwhile, chambers that I cut square, so without any taper on this rod, they'll run great with low pressure ammunition, but high pressure ammunition and uh, high weight bullets consistently have extraction issues. And the only difference between the two barrels is one has a little bit of taper and one has no taper at all. It really does make the difference. And so I very much do encourage anyone who goes about this, uh, goes ahead and attempts at least to make a tapered chambering rod. It's not very hard. 
Rod is very cheap. If you mess up, just go ahead and give it another try. But enough about taper and chambers. Let's get on to our actual main assembly one more time. So you take your fitting fixture combo, just like before. Install the barrel into it, just like before. This time we're going to be turning our attention to these two guys. These are more end pilots that go on the barrel and they have a hole to hold everything concentric. But this time it's the throating and chambering end pilots. So for those of you who don't know, a rifle barrel actually has three major sections in it. We've talked about the rifling, we've talked about the chamber, but there's actually something going on in between them. And that's known as the throat. Because the case itself goes into the chamber, and the bullet will go into the rifling. We you know, we understand that's you know the, the bullet goes into the rifling, the case goes into the chamber. We understand that, but uh, more complex uh, pe you know, people who understand guns a little bit better will realize. Well, hang on, the bullet is sitting there at the end of the case. If you stick the case in, won't you have to start ramming the bullet into the rifling as you're trying to insert the case? And the answer is yes. And so that's what the throat is for. The throat is sort of a, a gap between the chamber. In the rifling and all that the throat does is it's like a relief where it's not chambered and it's not rifled it's just kind of like slightly bigger than bore diameter and all that is is sort of a relief for the bullet to sit inside because ordinarily you know the bullet sticks out of the cartridge some and just to make it so you don't have to jam that bullet into the rifling at all the throat is just sort of a relief so we actually do have to cut our throats here which is kind of ironic because like cutting your throat also means bad things but in this case cutting our throat's a good thing because it will ensure consistent reliable function of our firearm so we install our barrel like we had just talked about and you're going to use your uh, chambering tool for both chambering and throating because it's got a taper it doesn't really make a difference because you just have to open your throat up ever so slightly uh, past where your bore diameter will be so the way that these tools work is you take your finished chambering tool and you stick it inside of your throating end pilot, the one marked with the T. You use that one first and then you stuff this whole assembly up onto the barrel. And just like that you'll make your same electrical connections so your, your cutting tool will be connected to your power supply, your workpiece will be connected to your power supply. The only thing to be careful of here is because you know whenever we use this tool we set the exposed length of metal to a very particular length and now you know this tool accounts for that very particular length it is possible to accidentally raise that you know not not have your tool completely seated against the bottom not have the chambering tool completely seated against the bottom of your uh, throating or chambering end pilot and that would cause your throat to be further up the barrel than you want so you have to pay close attention whenever you're, you're doing this and the documentation gives you very clear warning about like pay close attention at this point not to make this common mistake so it's important that the metal tool be pressed all the way against the bottom here we'll reinstall this and just visually inspect every time that this uh, metal part stays flat against the bottom here as well as whenever you make your electrical connection here which is usually just with a little alligator clip that the alligator clip doesn't push this tool up at all okay so with all that out of the way this is the way that you'd cut your throat you'd cut your throat until uh, the, you know, the documentation specifies the exact number that you'd cut to but generally you're just cutting your throat enough that a bullet itself could go all the way past where a bullet would sit in the chamber and so I'm sorry, I worded that terribly. You're cutting your throat until a bullet on the end of a cartridge would be able to go far enough that a fully chambered cartridge wouldn't push the bullet into the rifling at all, but the bullet would be right next to the rifling. So the bullet doesn't have to travel far down the barrel before it hits the rifling, but a chambered bullet on a cartridge would not actually be touching the rifling at all. The documentation explains that better and just tells you exactly how to accomplish that without confusing you. I apologize if that was very confusing for some people. So after you end up cutting your throat, the chambering tool actually works the same way as the throating tool, where you just have to push it on all the way, make sure it stays pushed on all the way, and you just cut with this tool until you're capable of fully chambering a cartridge, and then at that point your barrel is ready to test fire. So we've gone over this in about 30 minutes here. I apologize if I've been confusing at some points, and I do want to assure you that the documentation 
will probably make the thing, you know, the things that are unclear in the documentation, this video should make clear. The things in this video that aren't very clear, the documentation should be able to make clear for you. Um, I want to stress that we've had multiple people who know that not only have they had they never touched a gun, they'd never bought a gun or owned a gun or shot a gun, right? And they've managed to make their own barrels via this process. You know, a person who's not really a technical person, not really a gun person, has been able to make their own, you know, rifled chambered, uh, accurate barrels, you know, accurate, safe, reliable barrels in their own homes for you know, relatively low effort and relatively low cost because the, the process itself isn't actually very hard. Um, I'd like to take I'd like to be able to take some credit for the fact that the documentation is fairly good, but I really do think that it's it's more than that, and that probably the, you know, the bulk of this is just due to the fact that it's really not a very complex process, all things considered. You don't have to be a technical person, just have to be able to follow along in the documentation and have a little bit of patience while you learn it. So hopefully this has been helpful. I would like to take just the last couple of seconds here to thank a couple of people. Probably first and foremost would be Jeff Rod. He's uh, been a 3D printed gun person in the 3D printed gun world longer than I have even. And uh, he's always been helpful and responsive. And he's the one who told me whenever I was first looking into do-it-yourself barrels, I was looking into like button rifling and old school ways of doing it. And he told me like, no, that's stupid. Just do electrochemical machining. And I was really wary at first because I was in the same place that probably a bunch of you guys were, are right now. Probably some of you people listening to this are like, okay, well, it still sounds really confusing because it's electrochemical machining just sounds like no fun. It sounds very complex. I know it's a, it's a scary sounding word, but you know, Jeff Rod sort of gave me the same sort of speech I'm giving you guys now where it's like, okay, it sounds complex, but it's actually really super simple, especially if you've got a 3D printer because the 3D printer does all the hard work for you. Making a rifling mandrel by hand without a 3D printer, forget it. Button rifling is a better option. But if you have a 3D printer, this is really easy to do. You just set up your printer, tell it to print it, and then you've got yourself, you know, progressive rifling at home for almost next to no cost. This mandrel was probably a dollar and less than a dollar in plastic to print. So that's that's really cool. That's novel and awesome. And I owe it to Jeff Rod to, to I owe it to Jeff Rod to essentially say don't be stupid because he told me don't be stupid, use electrochemical machining. And obviously that worked pretty darn well. Uh there's a couple people who would like to remain anonymous who were beta testers of not only the first version of the electrochemical machining setup, but the second version. And their sort of input on the making the documentation more clear, more precise, better worded, as well as troubleshooting and coming up with better ideas for designs. That sort of feedback has been extremely useful and extremely helpful. And I think it's refined the version two setup here to the point where it really is extremely simple. It really is extremely easy. And it's getting close to the point where, you know, there's no excuse at this point. You can't really say it's too hard. You can't really say it you know, doesn't make sense to you. You just have to put in a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, read the documentation, watch the video, and it gets you where you need to be. Anyway, I hope this video has been useful, helpful to some of you guys. I think it paired with the documentation should set you on the right track to making your own barrels at home. I'll leave you with that. Uh, everybody take it easy.